a video, um, and this is what I'm gonna call your new ritual. Now, I have no idea, you know, I've asked you some questions about behavior and what he knows and what you'd like to be addressed, but I have no idea what it looks like um, at home, like going through doorways, um, entering and exiting crates, that kind of thing. And how we set the tone for every activity or every interaction that we share with our dogs is extremely important. So, uh, if my interaction with my dog is, hey, hey buddy, I just got home, and they're like super worked up and they're great excited, and then I just open the door and let them out without like any obedience or waiting or calming down, I'm like, hey buddy, I'm home. And I open the door and they get super excited and I greet them. That's not the right tone. So basically what you're saying is get excited, that's a one step. Hey, you guys, come on. That's one step towards creating separation anxiety because when we make a big deal of coming and going, dogs start to have issues with humans coming and going. And believe it or not, excitement is the root of that issue. So we wanna avoid separation anxiety. We wanna avoid encouraging excitement, uh, especially first thing. Uh, because, Nuka, enough. Excuse me. Um, we want to encourage the dog to start calm and attentive and relaxed. Um, the more excited we get when we start activities, the more anxiety we'll create in our dogs. And most people, including dog trainers, can't actually control dogs the higher they get, the higher their level of excitement gets. So it's important that we cap that excitement and especially inside the house and especially going through thresholds. So I actually think this is one of the most important parts of my training. Um, I know that this is, you know, you're sitting here thinking, hey, I, I just, I really want a dog that, that looks at me out in the outside world and comes uncalled. But, you know, we are relationship trainers. So we're building, how do you create that in, in a faster way in a cleaner way, in a more productive way, and, and then also not to ruin any of your tools, because tools are tools, they're not a state of mind, so dogs can actually become very desensitized towards tools if we don't have the whole lifestyle in place. So this, this whole ritual that I'm about to go through is actually one of the most important parts of my training, and I'm gonna ask when Oso comes home that you spend a lot of time focusing on it every single time you go to get him out of his crate. And you're gonna be going to get him out of his crate several times a day because he's gonna be in it more when he goes home. Uh, I'll, I'll go into maybe that explanation later, or else this video is gonna last forever. But, so, when, but basically when Oso comes home, he's not gonna be free unless he's, you know, or he's not gonna be out of his crate unless he's training with you. So this is a temporary thing, and I'll, again, I'll explain the reasons why later, but because this is the most successful to approach to get you where you want the fastest, and also the, with precision, and that it's clean and consistent, is that you're gonna be coming and getting, doing this ritual five times a day minimum with him. So it's really important that, especially when he first comes home, that you really, really take your time and make sure your expectations are very accurate and consistent with one another. Don't go to his crate one time. Okay, buddy, like I've been gone for a while. You really need to get outside and get your exercise and go potty and I'm just gonna cut corners and rush all of this. Every time you have that mentality, the training gets backtracked a hair. And so, the cleaner you are, the more precise, the more, the, you know, the more consistent you are with your expectations and the slower you go, regardless of how quickly you get outside, um, the better for the dog in the long run. So now on to the new ritual, crate etiquette. This is the first thing you go to his crate. I cover dogs crates. Um, I don't know, your house is probably pretty quiet, but with this new pup that might change things. Um, sleep is pivotal for training. The, uh, they retain the information while they're sleeping. So this guy's gonna need to get a lot of sleep throughout the day, which means he needs to be, this is one of the reasons why we cover the crate. It allows them to sleep through maybe distractions that might be going on in the environment that they might visually wanna fixate on. So if this is a 
if you're if you you're feeling like he might not be sleeping or you know um, maybe uh, the puppy is you know in his line of sight for some reason which it probably shouldn't be um, you know covering the crate might be a really good idea for you also the crate needs to be in a really really quiet room not next to a window that he can look out of not in the middle of the living room it can be in your bedroom I don't care about that but we want it to be away from traffic, high traffic areas, away from windows that they can look out and bark, um, and, and, and basically in a very quiet place where they can take a good nap or go to bed for the night. Um, so as I come to the crate, I'm gonna open this door or this uh, blanket, and you can see that Oso is standing. So right now, I really hope he doesn't give me trouble with this because he gave me a little bit of trouble yesterday. But right now, what I'm doing, good. See how he sat? What I've been doing is waiting for him to sit before I open the door. So that's step one is, I, didn't, I don't actually say sit, I just wait for them to sit. And so it took, at first it didn't take very long at all, but um, about halfway through yesterday, he decided that he didn't really like that process so he decided to stand and kind of get stiff and just stare at me for a long time it took about 20 minutes before he sat down and that's the most intense you know I've had with him he didn't do that this morning so I'm not real sure what he's gonna do today I'm hoping he's not gonna do a 20 minute freeze on me um, but what I want you to do is when you come to his crate don't say hi don't get excited don't greet him you're just gonna stand, sit here, and wait for him to sit. Don't say sit. He doesn't have a tool on right now. I don't have a means to follow through. I don't have a means to make it happen. So I'm not gonna ask for it if I can't make it happen. It's just a waiting game. And this allows the dog's brain to go from an excited state to a calm state on their own. That's a self-soothing process. It's really healthy for dogs to learn how to calm themselves down. So by us not interfering with high, high energy or excited energy, and we're not demanding things of them, uh, the, the dog's brain gets to actually go through those steps on its own and, and self-soothe. Um, so that's why I do it. That's why I don't give commands. Um, and what, you know, he just got here, so this is gonna be a lengthier process. Um, when he goes home, he's gonna have, these are gonna be smoother, faster repetitions, and he might throw some curveballs at you at first because he might not do this with you. But I want to encourage you to wait and, and follow all these steps because once they happen, they happen really, really fast and then it becomes the dog's second nature. And so it's like the dog's second nature to calm down for you before they're going through thresholds, which is a huge part of training. It's very important. Um, I should have seized the moment he sat down again. So the moment he sits down, I'm going to reach for the gate latch. Um, I don't know what kind of crate he's in at home. Uh, I prefer plastic crates. I feel like they're more den-like and more comfortable for dogs. So that's why he's in one here. Um, I don't know if, I, again, I don't know what kind of crate you have at home, but that's, that's why I chose a plastic crate for him. So I'm just gonna sit here and wait. And I will say a lot of my training is waiting, you know? A lot of my training is just, uh, you could call it free shaping if you want, but it's the dog, uh, you know, figure it out on your own. Um, and that I'm gonna make sure you understand the yes when you do what I want you to do by moving forward, but until you can perform the tasks that I need you to, um, I'm just gonna sit here and wait for you to figure this out on your own. And he already knows this. I mean, you've already seen him sit twice. So um, he's just got a little anticipation and anxiety. You know, he's an excitable dog. Right there, see how he sat down? I reached for the latch right when he sat down. That was my, that's my marker. That's me telling him sitting down is what I want. I will move forward if you sit. And that's, he learned that very quick. Now he has to stay in a sit. So he almost got up again. If he would have stayed up and not stayed in a sit, I would have removed my hand and started over. 
But since he's seated in the sit, I'm going to unlatch the crate. Again, I unlatch it and then I hold it there for a second to see will he stay in a sit. And if he doesn't, I close it back up. So I'm going to move backwards every time he gets excited and moves forward. And I'm going to move forward every time he stays in a sit. Now I'm going to open the door and see what he does. And he needs to stay. Door open doesn't mean go. Right? So if he were to try to bound out, I would, there we go. He just did it. I'm going to just, now I didn't close the door all the way. I didn't latch it. I actually just applied pressure with the door, which actually sent him back into a sit. So it's more like boop, 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 and, and you don't have to close it. Okay. Now he's doing really, really well. So now I'm going to invite him out. Okay, buddy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to leash him. Let's go. Because what I don't want is him running around acting like a genius. Now, I know this might sound silly to you, because in a lot of ways, um, you're probably satisfied with this guy, but it's important that he comes out of his crate on a leash when he first comes home to maintain calm. You know, we don't want this guy running around and getting himself all worked up. I don't know how he is at home. I don't know, you know, what his level of excitement is of going out crates and going through doorways, but most dogs are extremely worked up about this process. Um, and he, he appears that he probably does at home, um, even though he's being pretty calm right now. So what I do is I, after I leash them and bring them out of their crate, I only give them about three feet of leash and they might try to run around, but they're just gonna keep, I'm just gonna stand here and they're just gonna keep hitting the end of the leash. So they, they realize that they don't really actually get anywhere by getting worked up and excited and trying to move forward, All right? So then, what I do, which I'm gonna to have to reset the camera here, but after he's calmed down, typically I'd be putting his e-collar on. I have not introduced him to the e-collar yet. He still has some pressure release work to learn before we go there. There we go. All right, so there's the door he's gonna be going out of. His crate's somewhere over here, right? But we're gonna start back, okay? So after you get him out of the crate, you would typically put him in a sit, put his e-collar on him. He's going to have his e-collar on anytime he's outside of his crate for a while. It's not just for hiking, it's for communication in general. And we're going to go, let's go, and we're going to walk through this door. And this is the second phase of my ritual, door etiquette. So that was crate etiquette. That's what crate etiquette should look like. So it should be your new expectations for crate etiquette. Door etiquette is... Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started on that. So we're going to break it down into five steps. The first step is, uh, oh, so you have to walk to the door with me. Okay. I do not want him beating you to the door. That is a big no, no. So if I go, okay, let's go. And he shoots in front and goes, open the door. And he's in front of me. And then you back him up and put him into a sit. That doesn't count. That's not door etiquette. And the reason why is because it's bossy. It's bossy behavior. Cattle dogs are extremely infamous for bossy behavior because cattle dogs were bred to control cattle. So they love to control things. And because we don't give them cattle, it's usually the human that they choose to control. And so that's one, the crate etiquette is one way to block control mechanisms. Door etiquette is another. You're not going to to, to go to this, no, no time for the rest of your life are you gonna to go to a door and tell me you need to go outside. It's just not gonna work like that. Unless you have diarrhea and I can tell you need to go out badly, you shouldn't be, no dog should be bossing a human in and out of a door. You're gonna set yourself up for super duper extreme failure and your dog's gonna blow you off out in public because you're not relevant. Why the heck would I listen to that lady? I boss her around all the time and she listens. She opens doors for me all the time. It's crazy, right? So I know I'm, it, it's small, it's little, but it's super significant, right? So the first thing is, come here, good job. He's gonna walk to the door with you. Come here. And then you're gonna sit him. Good, sit. Then you're going, step two, after that, that process has, let me actually backtrack real quick. I don't think I explained this. And if I did, I'll repeat it in the video. He is already walking to the door with me. 
now I don't know what he's doing. He caught flames or something. I think that's that dog's food maybe he wants. Here. Here. For every step he tries to get in front, you need to stop walking. Okay, so let's say you're walking to the door. Let's go. And you take two steps and he shoots in front of you. You're going to stop walking. You're going to say, you could even back up a little bit if you want. You're going to say, oh, so come here, which he'll know much better when he gets home. Let's go and do it again. So for every single step from his crate to that door that he tries to get in front of you, it's your job to stop, reel him back into that healing position, and then start again. This is how you're going to teach him. Come here, sit. Good job. This is how you're going to teach him what he needs to be doing at doorways, right? If he's allowed to beat you there or walk in front of you there, he's not going to make the connection that he needs to follow you to a door. Luca! Let's go. Sit. Good. Step two. I'm going to just undo this little doorknob right here. That's it. That's step two. I want to know how the dog feels about the doorknob. Sometimes, in some cases, all it is is when people reach for the doorknob. That's all it takes. They don't even have to twist it. And that can be step two. But basically, the doorknob is step two in that he stays in a sit and he doesn't anticipate and break his sit and try to go through the door. Right? If he did. Actually, I'll go to that at the end of these steps. Step three, door open. Door open doesn't mean go. Right? So I want this door to be all the way open and I want him to stay in the sit. Step four, eye contact. Now when I get the eye contact, we're gonna to go to step five. And I don't ask for it, just wait. A lot of what I do is waiting because I want the dog to do it on their own. Good. Here, that's step five. Now what I want is for him to go through the door with me together. Here. And what he did was he shot out in front of me. So I started over. And that's what I was going to tell you at step two. Come. Here. Sit. Sit. Good. For every single step that he makes a mistake, you're going to start over. Let's go. For every step he gets right, you can keep moving forward. And you only have to move back. Come. Here, good job. Sit, good. You only have to move back on the step he got wrong, right? So let's say I go, he met me at the door, I twist the doorknob, I open it, he gives me eye contact. None of this do I need to backtrack, right? Because he's doing it perfectly. But the fifth step, I say here, which is my heel command, and he shoots through the door, I'm going to back up and just start that step over. So I can, that's the one step he messed up on. So let's see how he does this time. Here. So he's going to shoot out instead of staying there. So I'm going to back up here and show him what I meant by that. Good. Sweet. Good. If I were to say, oh, so sit. And step four, he gave me eye contact, right? But maybe the eye contact shot him through the door. I would call him back, put him in a sit, wait for eye contact again. If he can maintain the sit, we would say it here and go through the door together. So hopefully that makes sense. We're going to do one more door just to show you another example. Let's go. But I'm always backtracking the step that they, um, that they have a, a little air on just to show them exactly what I want with that precision and that high expectation. And for every step that I feel confident that they have followed through to my expectation, we're gonna move forward to the next step. So it's kind of this pattern. I'm not gonna move forward. I might even be, I might even back up if you don't listen or you don't comply to my expectations and your reward is gonna be moving forward when you do. And that's where a lot of dogs, that's what all dogs really want. <laughs> that's the thing. Most dogs just want to move forward. All right, they, let's go. Let's get out the crate. Let's get out the door. Let's go on that hike. Sorry for the terrible camera work. 
So, um, because dogs, and I can tell Oso's like this, he's very, he anticipates, and I can tell he really wants to move forward, right? He's a, he's a higher, higher, high energy dog. He's like an excitable dude as well. So he really wants to move forward. He really wants to get out that door. So I can use forward momentum as a reward. And when the dog puts that together, they're more incentivized to listen because it's not just a physical motion that gets them through the door. They have to comply with this whole picture, right? A lot of people go, oh, sitting is good enough. No, it's not. That's why I'm going over this. Um, this is creating a state of mind, and that's what I specialize in, basically. I'm not an obedience trainer. I, I would try to create a certain state of mind, and it's rooted in pack drive. So, um, all right. Next door. Let's go. Notice how leash my, or loose my leash is, and it's because I really want to see what he's going to do here. I need, to, I need to give him the choice to make the right choice. We got the crate, we got the door, now we're outside. You're gonna come here and you're gonna sit, give me eye contact. Okay, now you can go potty, All right? So that's how your new ritual is gonna look. You can actually start doing this with your puppy, although it's, puppies are really, really hard. So do the best that you can, but we're gonna encourage you to do this with your puppy so you can even get started now. Um, and the, I'm just gonna go over one last thing and then I'm gonna wrap this up. This is permission-based training, basically. In other words, you don't get to move forward until I give you permission. And what that does is makes the handler extremely relevant. If they don't get a burst through crates and doors and they have to basically, basically they go outside and they're given permission to release, okay, you're free, go potty. Um, it, everything's coming through you, you know? The only way I can get out of this crate is if I do something for her. The only way I can get through this door is if I do something for her. You know, I, I can't go and be free in the yard until I do something for her. And so we're breaking it down into little steps and they're really, they might not seem big to you, but to the dog, they're huge. And so what that's gonna do is gonna create that attentiveness that you're longing for, you know? My mom means everything to me. I just kinda wanna pay attention to her and watch her because she's got all this information, all these really good things come from her. I'm always moving forward with her and going on adventures and yada, yada, yada. So you see the dog starts to build up this strong desire to be attentive to you by, by creating these permission-based type activities, even though they're very simple. So it might seem uh, monotonous, it might seem a little anal retentive. Uh, eventually also will become very quick an expert at this, it won't take long for him to get it. I mean, you can already tell with doors and stuff, he's already solid. I don't, and maybe you've already done it because doors have been pretty easy from day one. So you might already be doing like some fraction of this. Um, 
but I just want to encourage you to keep that, that permission-based training where he's kind of always looking at you and before he gets to move forward because what that's going to do is build that, that attentiveness and relevancy that you're desiring from him so you, he becomes, uh, you become more important than all of the outside stimulants that he tends to gravitate towards. So hopefully you like that.